Hello friends, my name is Steve and we are here today to discuss chapters 9 through 13 of the Warrior Prophet. I had to double check, double check my notes to keep getting the chapters wrong. So 9 through 14 and 13. we're here with 9 through 13, excuse me. <laughs> it's been that kind of week. So we're here again with uh, our friends Katerina and Daniel. Uh, Katerina, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Katarina, and this is my second time reading through The Warrior Prophet. And I'm Daniel, and this is my at least third time, and it's been good. It's been fun. What have you thought so far, Steve? Well, it's my first time, and I'm, uh, we were talking a little bit before we started recording, is, um, it doesn't feel like a lot happens, but it, it at the same time, it feels like a lot happens. It doesn't, I don't know if it's because the, um, this book doesn't feel as dense and as heavy as the first book does. I don't know if that's part of it, but when you sit back and think about it, like things happen and things are revealed, but it doesn't seem as, um, as eventful for some reason. What do you, what do you both think? Yeah, I think the first part that we finished last week was a lot of build up and slow movements towards the thing that happened in this part. So I, I, I felt the same way. I also felt like uh, not much, even though I have loads of notes, I didn't really feel like a lot of important things happened, a lot of important revelations um, happened in the first part. But in this part, this part, this part, the, the first half of part two was, was actually a lot of fun. And it also might have to do something with the fact that we uh, return to some of my favorite characters. Like I, I'm a sucker for the, for the Ikirais. So that always makes me happy to see them pop up on the page. Hmm. What about you, Daniel? What do you think about that? I've <clears throat> thought this book so far has been kind of like a orchestra it's had its slow moments and then the wars have been big moments sometimes he talks about the deaths of like thousands of people very casually and over just a couple pages the sacking of cities and sentences or barely paragraphs but there has been a lot that happened in these chapters we read that it's been like a kind of like a cl climactic point of the story so far. Hmm. Yeah, it does seem like a uh, like a road trip, like a bad road trip that you. Um, well, it, may, it also made me think, you know, even in, back in history, if you were just a random village somewhere that didn't have a lot of defense, or you just kind of minding your own business by yourself and have your little set up and someone came through and just decided that you were, you know, they, <laughs> you were no longer going to live, then you had no power at all. I mean, there's no one to protect you. So they, it would, they did, it seemed very casual that they went through these villages and they just decided to kill people or and Daniel, like you mentioned before about the, the lamb's blood on the door. Uh, but you know, are they, the way that they tortured people and it just seemed very casual and you almost forget the way that the characters interacted that it almost felt like they were on a on a vacation but there was all this really terrible all this really terrible stuff happening so it was, it was kind of uh interesting the way that worked out because it's such a big army or such a big um uh, group so maybe uh yeah it just feel, seemed kind of weird yeah it, it does feel like a lot of the violence is just incidental to what's happening um because when you think of it most of for most of the characters, the fact that there are some civilians dying, or even that they're conquering some small villages, like that's not, that's not really their concern. They're either concerned with um, gaining gaining power within the, the the politics of the holy war, or like Kalas or uh, Kami, and they're you know concerned with. Uh, deciding whether someone is a prophet sent, sent to them by gods and who they should follow uh who's worthy of, of you know of, of their worship so it's the holy like the actual holy war the conquest it it doesn't it doesn't really seem to take 
uh, central focus for most of the characters and, and their story or or their their worries and and concerns. It's just an instrument to get them all together and move them a certain direction. And it had like the holy war itself has been quite secondary to like the councils and the inner fighting of the point of views we get but it doesn't take away like what is happening in that world it's kind of like when the crusades happened the powerful people didn't think about the horrible things that were happening like in the villages as they swept through and did exactly what they did in this pretty much some of them they let either renounce their god and if they did they would become slaves and at least live the one part where they just started throwing heads over they like i think one who was it um it was in the city of Deirut. They somehow like r- routed out a thousand, couple thousand phantom and started throwing the severed heads over the wall. And they opened the gate after 131 heads had went over the wall. And they just went in and murdered all of them. It seems like a, like a no win situation, right? Because if you surrender and you just open the gates, they'll probably kill you. And maybe if you're lucky, you'll be a slave. But if you resist then they for sure will so it's like there's no good outcome for you it's just uh yeah i mean like the, the first city they marched through or it wasn't even a city it was just like a whole bunch of little like villages but they opened their doors to them it said and just like fed them and let them take what they wanted so they would leave them and it talked about them being a people that have been conquered by like the Phantom and reconquered by the Enrithi and they still survived their overlord leaders just by persevering. And the one group, I think, like mutinied and they killed all their captains and then opened the gate and then they ran through and still just butchered them all because heathens are bad enough. You don't want some untrustworthy heathens. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's 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 telling that the Phanim would prefer to surrender to the Nansor, even though they're the long they've been their long-standing enemy. Uh, but at least the Nansor are not like they're they're actually an organized army who listen who li- that listens to to their general. Um, whereas the other Inrithi, they're just running around, murdering, pillaging as 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 they like. Um, so, I mean, it's, in, it's interesting that you would rather sur- surrender to someone who you've been fighting with for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, rather than, rather than you know, some people you, you never met. <clears throat> like the familiar enemy that will let you die with dignity? As yeah, pretty to, much. So these, like, I don't know, they're... Their belief is so strong that there's nothing that they won't do to like someone they don't believe is tr- right. Somewhere in it, it talks about like a holy war versus a jihad. Because of course, the other side's religions like kind of saying the exact same thing they're saying. We're the chosen ones. We're gonna win. We're destined for greatness. So they both just clash with each other over their belief right or wrong yeah i think you could say that you know maybe because the the nansor and the kianine they've they've engaged with each other for so long like to the point where they don't just fight battles but they also like trade they will also trade captives they've negotiated with each other that they might see each other as human basically um not just some some token like faith symbol of faith um whereas the other in they never they never met the kiani before like for them there are these just abstract heathens um, so they won't 
they, I mean, it, make, it makes sense. They won't, they're not as compelled to feel compassion for them as the Nentor would be. One thing that I, um, I really liked is that we have more, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to butcher these names. Uh, Math, Mathanet, Mathanet. Mathanet's or, good. Mathanet. I think, uh, I liked for such a, a, you know, an important character. It doesn't seem like we've had a, a whole lot of him yet. So it's nice to peek in and see how he's doing and, um, kind of see where, where he is. His little battle of words with Zerius. What did you think of that, Katarina? <laughs> um, well, obviously, I'm rooting for the Romans. <laughs> <laughs> well, which in this case, well, Romans as in not, not the Pope, uh, the Byzantines. <laughs> the Emperor, you're ruling. Yes. Yeah. We know uh, no, I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Ike race, and as much of a despicable character that Zerius is, um, I don't know. Like you can't, like he 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 is a in a really an enviable position, in the sense that he's basically fighting to to save an empire that's been in decline for hundreds of years, and his his gamble is one way to to save not just just the empire as an abstract concept but just to save his people as well so i find it interesting that obviously he's not a very he's not a benevolent rule ruler there are a lot of reasons why his people might hate him but at the same time he's like he's doing stuff he's trying in his own wicked paranoid way he's he's trying to give them something better I think that's my take. I liked how we got a lot of his like inner thinking during that little procession to the <clears throat> holy site to meet Mithnet, where mm -hmm. it's like the light has to shine on the emperor always. There's weird rules. The emperor can never smell his people, it said. So there's just incense everywhere he's going. And at first he's thinking everyone loves him and he starts waving and then realizes they hate him then he thinks exactly what you say that he's like gonna be thought of as a great king because he's gonna reunite the empire and everyone should respect him and then he gets like angry he turns sour and affirm in his emperorness and just starts hacking people away then when he goes in and they're like chanting Nathanet and then they finally like start, I think the guards he had sent to spill blood in the streets, start chanting his name. That's what he told Nathanet. You hear that? Now they're calling my name and it's just a bunch of people screaming and dying. Yeah, he must have put them all to the sword. Yeah, I, I, I think Zirius has a big imposter syndrome. That is that might be actually justified, um, <laughs> because he constantly has to convince himself that he he is the emperor, that he's more than other people, that he's he's smarter, he he's more competent, he's he's more cunning, um, and the world keeps breaking breaking those like keeps keeps uh, breaking those ideas. It keeps. The world keeps telling him how 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 bad he is at his job, um, so I do feel for him, <laughs> you know, a little bit. And at, at some point during that, he's like, "What would Compass think?" And he's like, "Why would I even think? What would Compass think? I'm the emperor." <laughs> yeah, it's like he he constantly has to he, he has to convince himself that he is the god of men. Hmm. Um, which is I mean, it's hard like. To me, I, I would find that to me would be very anxiety inducing to somehow maintain the, the perception that like I'm above all people, I'm always right. It's, it's, it, like, if you're not one of those people who are already con convinced of, of their superiority, like Confucius, 
I think that's a pretty it's a pretty tough position to be in. If naturally you're inclined to feel inferior to other people. But do you almost have to have that that mindset though? Otherwise, it'll, you'll appear weak and vulnerable. I would say I would I would say it helps. I mean, you can certainly see that. Well, I don't know. I, I, some people in this world who are very confident are very successful. Conf is being the most obvious, uh, the most obvious example. Yeah. There's a part where he like tripped on his gown when he got out and everyone started <laughs> laughing at him. So he just like just freaks out and runs up the stairs and like, falls on the floor. And then the first thing Mathenet does is directly calls him out for his betrayal. And then it's like, oh, I'm just joking. <laughs> He's That's walking some tricky lines. And then we never got what the speech was, but... Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that Mathenet has come all the way to Momem to see Zerius in person. And I wonder why that is. Why did they have to meet face-to-face? I don't think we ever, like. I don't think we got the answer for that, um, but it's an interesting thing to think about. <laughs> Unless what Nathanet said when he first asked him was, "What do you think exactly?" Right, that he already basically knows that Ikri Confis had betrayed them to the Phantom, like. But maybe he doesn't. Who knows? Who knows what he knows? <laughs> he does see yep. the few, though. We know that. That's one thing. And he's pretty young and pretty smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, what uh, what can Mathanet do in Momem apart from having a chat with Sirius? It's 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 not like he. I don't know, has an army to, th- that he could use to put the emperor in his place. I don't, th- I don't, mean, I don't think he does. There, there, it, it, didn't, it, it wasn't mentioned. Hmm. Nope, but it let Ikri know that the slaves are his people and they probably outnumber the army and the, all the royals. He learned that out in the streets and then he hacked them all down. I'm sure they're not happy about that either. All those poor dead people's families. Yeah. Probably not. But so far, the uh, the Nenso army seems to be more effective than uh, a slave mob. And the, the Shrail Knights are gone. He sent them off, and then they all mostly died already. That is true. That's uh, unfortunately the case. That's what happened. Um, yeah, the um, the uh, the plundering or the pillaging and plundering was. I, I'm seeing more and more of the comparisons to Empires of Dust. You know that were. It reminds me of some of the scenes in that series. Yeah, it was quite casually done. Mm -hmm. A lot of the brutality as they, I think they're probably halfway to Shime by now, or close. I need to look at the map probably, but they've made a good, a a good distance by the end of this part. I haven't looked at the map in a while, probably should, should do that. There was a, a, one of these pages, um, Tab was uh, they began barricading themselves in their great doomed uh, with their wives and children g- they gathered wailing with soft carpets crying out their sins begging for forgiveness the thunder of rams at the doors would be their only answer in the rush of iron eyed swordsmen that that's pretty funny. bleak yeah yeah but it's it's funny the way it's just kind of 
you know, there's other things happening, but during the day they're just kind of, to, you know, it's a path of destruction. Doing what war, war parties do, which is never good. And I think that Ikari like achieved a victory over the Holy War, and Saban got super mad about it. Right, Henareth, he did not like what happened there at all. And said he's never going to let it happen again. We'll give him this little barren shit hole area. Yeah, um, because because Saban put it in his head that uh, what's the name of the city again? Henareth. Henareth. That uh, Hinnereth, for some reason, should belong to him, even though he does not have any um, reasonable claim to it. So, and he also has a pretty long um, history with Compass, with Compass besting him in some battle they fought at Momim, I think. So, uh, make makes sense he would get he would get upset about Compass uh, conquering Hinnereth before them. Yeah, that's true. I think he had fought him once and they fought like a stalemate or something, but at that time Confus was like just a little young like barely a man, so he was just mad about it. Should have won him. Well, that's what Sabin thinks. <laughs> yeah, totally, uh, you know, total opposite end of the spectrum, but I know we talked a little bit last week about um, Akka and Espinet, and there was a line that I highlighted. Um, let's see if I can find it. On uh, 215, or on my edition anyway, um, it was strange to be known, truly known, to be awaited rather than anticipated, to be accepted instead of believed, to be half another's elaborate habits, to see oneself continually foreshadowed, and in others' eyes, it's so you know, we have this really bleak, dark thing, and then we could they kind of have their um, their moments in this in this uh, these few chapters. Well, until later, but it, it's like this weird, twisted love story. That's in this. And then it says what two two bodies, one light one, or one warmth. One soul was it? Or, oh yeah, one warmth. Yeah. And then at the end, it's one body, one. One body, no warmth. <laughs> or as <laughs> net. Yeah. That was really unfortunate. And we got one more talk about Yal Grata's rank hammer. Did you guys catch that? Mm, I don't think so. Where was it? I th it was in a place called Nagragis. And General Nemerius was already there for the in for the emperor. And they opened the gate somehow, and the Thunieri like stormed inside, and they started having like pitched battles with the Nancer, and they met to like discuss a treaty. The general for the Nancer and Yagradis Rakehammer, and he just I forgot how it described it. It was. Basically, he died. I think he got brained. He brained him, that's right. Brained him. Frank Hammer brained him. And then the Nancer fled, and Thanyari just, I guess, probably killed everyone in the town. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet Confus was pretty pissed about that. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. The What do they call it? The fog of war nowadays? You don't really know what's happening in the battle or like right around the battle. It's all too confusing. It's not until like the people come in and inspect the dead bodies till you finally can like figure out what happened. I also think the Sunyeri are are probably not known as, as great negotiators, especially because most of them don't even speak Shake. Yeah, I don't think they care about negotiating. Yeah. They seem like even more feared than 
then what's his name? Then snares people. Then the oh, Sylvanti. So they seem almost more warrior and scary than them. But we haven't got to see any yet talk. So And Pontus and who was it? They were trying to decide whether Telus was a false prophet or not. <laughs> oh, Zin and Proyas. You want some arrest? Proyas. Yeah, thinks that he's taken the war from Athenet and asked Zin to go and like study, try to figure it out. <clears throat> and then Kellis just like ignored him during the beginning of the impromptu sessions. I think that's what they call them. And then he eventually uh, won him over. Are we talking about Martemis or about Zainimus now? I think it was Zinimus Pro is Proyas is general. Yeah, it, was, it was Zinimus and Proyas. Proyas doesn't trust Kellis, so he sent him out to go like try to weasel his way in his inner circle and figure out what he was. And then in doing so, Kellis turns in. To believe and by the end of this, the Echamian thing made Zinimus renounce all like contact with Proteus. Forgot what he called him. It was pretty insulting to the prince. He was mad. Yeah, he got pretty mad. Um but I do think it was Martem like I do think it was Confus who sent his general Martemus to uh to spy on Kellis. Though I think both, I think Proyas, at least at the first few chapters, is he's still undecided about Kellis. But Confus straight out hate, hates Kellis. And, and thinks that, uh, that Kellis is a Kisharim or Sisharim spy, mm -hmm. who's somehow uh, connected to Chaos. So I think that's why Confus sends Martemus to to try to infiltrate the uh, the cult that uh, Kellis has built around himself. Yeah, that's true. And Zin Zinimus is the host of the camp that they're all staying at, so he doesn't. He's already like a, basically a firm believer at this point. Only pro yes, isn't it? True. I think may maybe maybe pro yes has learned doubt from a commune. You know, in this case at least. Um a commune just seems to have fallen for Kellis pretty quickly. I think it's kind of like Pro yes is like belief in the literal as opposed to the nuanced, like it said Zinimus had, right? Zinimus could, like, talk to a sorcerer and still, like, be a good person and think he's going to be saved, whereas Proyas takes the tusk literally, and so he thinks that sorcerers are blasphemers and doesn't want to talk to Akamian and wants to, like, keep all of the blasphemy away from him, because he takes it all super literal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Zainimus is definitely more open-minded than uh, than Proyas. That's for sure. I'm, I'm not sure if either of you um, know the answer to this question, but from um, when Kellis does start getting a, a following and he talks about celebrating suffering. Is that based in any other religion? That I don't know if that was sounded almost like a Buddhist. Um, those roots are, or I'm not sure if either of you are familiar with where, what kind of influenced that. I'm not sure exactly what text it is, but it's definitely based on some beliefs. 
the Buddhists almost believe in like opposites, so it would be kind of one of their beliefs. It was explained really well. I liked how he did like these parts of enlightenment. I heard when he wrote them that he just had them. He like wrote hundreds. He wrote them like hundreds of times, hmm. and then eventually one would stick as good enough to be from Tillis's mouth. Yeah, I think Kellis is sort of like one of these uh, self-help gurus. <laughs> you know, who's who's, pre who's who's pretending or thinks that he's uh, helping you reveal some fundamental truths about yourself, and by understanding those tr those truths, um, you you might be able to change. The way you behave or change the way you think about yourself and about the world. Um, I know it did remind me a little bit of the 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 suffering, like accepting the suffering. It did, it reminded me a little bit of Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. I think he 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 does talk about sort of accepting the pain of of your existence. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not well read in philosophy whatsoever, so I I, I don't want to make any. Uh, wild conjectures baker does like nietzsche a lot and i guess kellis was going from a self-help guru and seeing that like mega churches are where the money's at so now he's gonna <laughs> become a pastor at a mega church huh yeah i think my problem with with reading those sermons is that because i know he doesn't mean it I, I, t I tend not to really pay attention to what he's saying. Like, it, it goes one year in, one year out. Because at the end of the day, like, it's... Th there may be ch some truth in it, but it's, 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 it's nonsense, or it's just words he uses to manipulate people. He, like, lets you see the truth in it when he tells a story about a fur trapper that he met named Lewis and how he replaced replaced his wife with his dogs when one love dies you must learn to love another and he never finishes mm. the story yeah that's was, not how that, i that remember this touching yeah that's not how i remember this story from the prologue <laughs> uh, yeah this is true but it just shows that truth is what you make it he didn't lie it was technically part of the truth. There's just a lot of truth removed. <laughs> Lewis did run away to those woods because his wife died, and he did have all those dogs, and they were like his favorite things in the world. So that's true. He just didn't be like, oh, and then I came and ruined everything for him, and now he's dead. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was questioning whether Lewis ran away to um, honor the memory of his wife, mm. which I don't think that's how it was interpreted in the prologue, but uh, I guess this is a different interpretation of the same man. And it's both from, it, it, we, we only have this information from Kellis, so who knows? It seems like you learned a lot from Lewis in the short period of time that he was with him. But I, there's a couple of, uh, on 243, kind of the, the, these sermons really reminded me of like the mega church or like the, the snake handlers and stuff like that. Um, you are frail, you are alone. Those who would love you know you not. You lust for obscene things. You, for, you fear even your closest brother. You understand far, far less than you pretend. Uh, you are these things, frail, alone, unknown, lusting, fearing, and uncomprehending. Even now you can feel the truths burn. They consume you. If they weren't on the march, I think they'd have a church built by now, or some kind of, you know, structure. It's for him to, you know, have his pulpit. And when he was up in the north, he had already converted, like, a small <clears throat> army up there to... I'll die in the mountains for him to even have made it here. So. 
I think you, uh, towards the end of this, uh, at the end of chapter 13, um, you really see he just has, uh, there's no, you know, no one really matters to him. Uh, well, at least Survey doesn't. <laughs> just uh, a tool for him to use. Like uh, we've been talking for the last, probably since the beginning of the first book, but he just, they're just tools at his disposal and they, they don't really matter to him. I, have, I can't help but feel bad for Survey. I don't know. I, I would question your entire personality if you did not feel bad for Survey. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good. She's just kind of going along and trying to, you know, she's like his, uh, it seems like they get closer and she's almost like his companion. Um, and then it, and then maybe not. Well, I mean, he does send her to uh, have sex with a commune just yeah. because it's... Yeah another way of him to uh, get Akka, make Akka closer to him or give him a reason to um, to to basically uh, reveal the Gnosis to him eventually. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was him because I thought it was it really happened but I was on the fence of whether because um, she tells him, it is you, I can see you, I can see. And then he sees Espinet, but I, was, yeah, I wasn't sure how much of that actually happened or if that was some kind of vision or something he was having. It's supposed to remain kind of vague, but <clears throat> as you read along, at first it gets confirmed by one and then another and then another and then another. So it's confirmed by all four to have happened in like a kind of druggedly way, it seems like. I want to ask a question, and it was in the chapters, but it just seems like I shouldn't ask the question. For spoilers sake, or what? Are... Yeah. There's just a part where Kellis goes into a probability trance, and the mm. things he says is strange-seeming. They don't seem to fit hmm. with what's happening. It does seem like um, he's seeing at least one possible version of the future. I mean, it's the probability is trans. So you, I guess the idea is that you have different things that can happen in the future and you assign the probabilities to them, right? Seemed like right after he did that, and it says like he breathed out, and then like what did he call it? Revelation, and then after that, seemed to start acting faster, like meddling in things, like he's found the path, maybe hmm. at least to, maybe. to a certain point of the precipice. Yeah. We'll talk about it more when it happens. I'm going to remember to bring this up, but I'm not <laughs> going to say anything. All right. It, it was highlighted in my notes. Um, but ultimately, at this point, you can tell if all these things will happen or if none of them will happen. Um, some people might say that um, it's, a, it's a prophecy. You know, he's, he says he has, he's, had a, he's had a revelation. And, and they then, call him the prophet. And then afterwards, he once again confirms that what comes before determines what comes after. Even after this most recent prophecy he had. So it's not prophecy to him, at least not yet. I love how careful you both are with uh, certain things. Uh, those of you who, who are listening, they both have this weird grin on their faces. And... <laughs> <laughs> these, they, these books get significantly more complex. This is just one small layer of the books. This fun holy war we're in, we're in the middle of. 
Yeah, I do get the feeling that this holy war is like a distraction, or it's like it's not really what. It's not really that big of a of a story for some reason. Like it's it's a big event and it's it's important, but it's not the main um, conflict. Maybe the same thing it is in the books. He like it's like a secondary vehicle for his characters to do what they're doing. Yeah, but anyway, I think even if even if you read the the prophecy or the the revelation that he has at the end at the end of the at the end of chapter nine, even if all those things happen, event even if all those things happen eventually, I don't think you have like it doesn't really tell you anything. I don't think you have a way of deciphering it at this point. So that's why I'm not say hell say nothing. <laughs> But it's a, it's a cool thing to go back to once you've finished mm, the thousandfold thought, probably. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, True. yeah, we'll have to put a bookmark on this one for sure. I'll have to get the page number from you. All right. Uh, and there's a part where I, I came, he's talking to the Kamian, and he's already trying to like make himself seem like a prophet to a Kamian, right? And he says, I don't recognize my own voice. At one point he told him, like, when I talk, it doesn't even sound like me. Now he's saying that most of the time I don't even recognize my own voice. Someone else is talking. And a Kamian seems to have taken a bait right before he gets word of a, some cool new books. And just like us, he drops everything and just, like, head straight for the books yeah i thought that was i i kind of took that as almost like a there was some uh some quotes about how great books are and i kind of felt like that was a wink and a nod kind of thing for the reader and how what was the quote something about how books like what are books besides like a long moment for us to allow someone else to move our soul which is what happens when you read books it was good. Didn't go good, but it was good. It was good writing. Yeah, and Espinette gets left behind again after they they start to kind of get this um, connection, and they you know they have this bond, and they're getting so they're getting really close. And then he just, I'm gonna jump on. I'm gonna, I'll be back. Like I need some time alone, and it doesn't work out too well for him. Yeah, I, I wonder. I wonder to what ex. I mean, obviously it's a commune's decision, but I wonder to what extent Callus has influenced that decision, because he does spend a lot of time in these like first three hundred pages working a commune and getting him to depend on Callus almost, um, and there's and. I wonder if when we can go back to talking about survey and Akami and having that uh, moment. Like I, I, I wondered, or at least the way I understood it was that that was a way for Callus to put a put a wedge between Esmond and Akami and and to make him less less dependent on her and force him to turn to Callus. Um, for, for answers or forgiveness or understanding or whatever it is that Kamian needs. I think it had that purpose. It had like a duality of purposes. Like it also served to kind of make a Kamian owe something to Kellis because he's like keeping a secret now from who he thinks is like a prophet. Hmm. So he's dealing with it a certain way. Esmanet deals with it a certain way, and she's just kind of like mad about it, but quiet, quiet mad about it, which is dangerous for women to be quiet mad. <laughs> and Sarah thinks like they all feel a different way about it. Kellis, of course, just is using it as a tool. I forgot how it 
described that he used their way, but it was rude. It was impolitely. And in the end, he offers to give Sarway to Nair, back to Nair after he's taken her for the intellect of war. And he agreed, I guess. Looks like it. And I, you, he, I was surprised to hear um, he is like lusting after Sarway that he almost dare say cares about her. Well, maybe he cares about what he can get from her um, or how he, you know, having her around to do what he wants to, but it was um, maybe the first time that I remember seeing that side of his character, this uh, maybe, well, I guess his wife, um, he did talk about her favorably too, but about Sarway. I think it's um, because of the way he treated her. So I think the relationship between Sarway and Nayori is one of the most complicated in these books. It, it takes a lot to wrap your mind around it. Um, but we, we, do see, we do see Nayor conflicted in, in, in these chapters, not only about Surway, but also about uh, some of the Inrithi, like Proyas. It, like it seems that he's uh, formed some sort of affection for... Uh, for the people he's been spending his time with, um, and it's almost like and he, like he he chastises him, himself for feeling concern for them, or for enjoying the fact that they uh, respect him, and in his martial acumen, which is not something a, a skill vendi should feel, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. He's going through some things. And he, I think he moved out of camp. Sometimes he finds a village to go in and just murder a family within their house <laughs> or something like that. Who knows what? One time he just did worse things. He said he like stabbed a, st stabbed a hole into the ground with a knife and yeah, did things to it. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's going through a crisis since he lost his prize, Saraway. And he feels bad about the things he did to her, but he doesn't want to look like a weak little Nancer, like a weak little human. <laughs> and he has that same conflict when he's dealing with them, too. He has to, like, be the Sylvandi. He has to be the breaker of horse and man like he is hmm. Hmm. I guess we'll he, see how this war changes him he's already not like the rest of the Sylvendi from the beginning after Moingus broke him yeah. he's got like a Dunyane filter in him where he's like what would a Dunyane do what would why would a Dunyane do this so he thinks deeply and they were talking about how as kids they would learn songs to describe like the columns of the Kyanine warriors so all the kids knew like all of the banners of all of the Kyanine and that's why he like knew every banner that was there because instead of like the nursery rhymes they're doing war rhymes <laughs> And I mean, also, they don't have a writing system. Like, they only transmit information through a oral tradition. So that's like another small, like another like a little detail about the the cultures that I think make this world feel more um, realistic or more authentic. But uh, yeah, Nayor has uh, a lot of repressed emotions, and he needs uh, he needs to find some some outlet and, and let the steam off. Um, yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. And uh, a lot of people suffer for it. That's which is unfortunate. Rats him out. Rats Kellis out for mocking him. 
when Ellis is doing multiple voices and just make, <laughs> making fun of him. That was pretty good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was in, uh, impersonating everybody and speaking like that. Yeah, there was this, like, very short moment where it almost seemed like he was going to laugh along with them. And then he didn't. He said and he, like, got... looked in horror at them. And then that's he got in a big fight with uh, Akamian about it. Because Akamian, what did he say? Like, brothers mock each other, and that's, like, their love. Yeah. And he was like, what did he say? Is it love, or is it ignorance or something just I have to find it yeah I, I read that as another another way of Kellis trying to make a commune feel guilty but I don't know if that's that's why Kellis was so uh, upset about what what, what a commune said and it also made an air super mad. It had like a duality of effect. Everything Kellis is doing now seems to be with more purpose, if that makes sense, or with more direction. All the people that get affected by it react a certain way that is beneficial to him. So, um, if everything Kallus is doing and the pieces he's moving into place, was this thought out before, and I'm not expecting either of you to answer this question, but how far back was this planned? Because was Moingus and what he did part of this whole thing, is it all destined to happen this way? Or is it, um, yeah, I don't know. The Camian thinks for thousands of years is kind of all preordained. Everyone thinks it's various degrees of preordained. Hmm. Yeah, I wondered why Moingus uh, did what he did and kind of took him under his wing. If this was all um, planned. Moingus took Mayor under his wing? Yeah. I don't know. Kellis said it was his father's mistake, right? Mm. At one point. That's true. Yeah. He says, what is this, father, a mistake? And then... Do they make proceeds. mistakes, though? He made a mistake of his own. I don't remember exactly what it was. Oh, looking too long at Skios. That was an error on his part. I think he's made two mistakes actually in one guess at this point <laughs> he guessed yeah. for Saban oh, that's right. yeah. <laughs> I would say the Dunyang definitely make they definitely plan long ahead but there are still a lot of things they're not able to anticipate yeah they have what's the old Donald Rumsfeld quote, you have the known unknowns, the things that you know that you don't know, and then you have your unknown unknowns, the things that you don't know that you don't know. You can never know the things that you don't know that you don't know until they mess up your plans. And maybe a Kimian getting lost was one of those for Kellis. Definitely doesn't serve his purpose at this point because he had just decided he was gonna give him the gnosis, right? And now he's gone. He'd made up his mind that he's gonna risk it all. Yeah, that didn't work out too well. Wow. Well, yeah. well some, I mean, something we didn't know. Sorry, something we no. didn't know until now is that uh, Kellis is uh, one of the few. Yeah. Um, I don't know I don't know if you were surprised by that, Steve, or not. I was, yeah. Well, I yeah, should have been, but... We got to see that doll in action. Oh, yeah, that's right. He, turns, he brings the doll to life. Yeah, I don't 
I don't think I noticed any foreshadowing of that. I I, I don't I don't think Callus ever talked about seeing the mark on people or in things before, as far as I can remember. So I, I mean, reading it for the first time, I think it should it should come as a big surprise. Yeah, I, I didn't like see that coming. If you go to the prologue, when he like looks upon the no god, he sees something in him, and he talks about like it, him not being like normal, him being like weird, as if he can kind of he doesn't know it's magic though. So the way he's describing it is vagueish, but hmm. <clears throat> he appeared to see that the non man was like something more too. Yeah, I, I might go back and reread that section because I I did I guess I just assumed that the description was strange because this was the first time he was seeing a non-man. Um, yeah, and magic but... and shrink. It was all strange to him, so his descriptions <laughs> might seem strange. Yeah, and he did get weirded out by a twig earlier, so yeah, for a week or a month. No. Yeah, I like that the the doll. What it, what I forgot how it was worded that it's moving from the inside and not the outside. Like something inside is moving it. Well, it was like a slack bag, and then all of a sudden the face, like the nose, appeared in the bag, and the eyes. Yeah. That was that was pretty trippy. Cinemus hated it. Cinemus did not like that one bit. He did get pretty mad. And then it talked about, like, Akamian struggle, like, sorcery is blasphemy, and he talks about the guy who, like, everyone hates who betrayed uh, Henry Seginus, the guy that tried to give him a wood, uh, bone staff or something. I think like, he tried to I, give him a kingdom. Yeah, he gave him all his stuff and a bone staff. The bone staff was like magical and would have like ruined his holiness. But he gave him everything else just so he would take it, I think is like what the story kind of was. And uh, temptation. Yeah. And yeah, as as Menon seems to suggest that uh a Kamian might be the temptation for Kellis and that the right choice for Kellis would be to uh, refuse a commune and refuse to learn the Gnosis. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then a Kamian like struggles with the fact that he's damned, but like sorcery is like singing God's language and prophets speak God's language. So if a prophet sings God's language, is he really damned? If he's already like speaking God's language? Technically not, right? Maybe. So that's no. like the, the no. struggle Akamian is having right now. And then it, it also like talks about how when the second apocalypse comes, they're supposed to share the Gnosis so they can be ready to fight the No-God. So he's thinking he's the first one that's going to share the Gnosis, but now it's in a good way instead of like the bad way. He's converted his beliefs into like thinking it's all a good thing. And then he disappears, but he killed two Scarlet Spires. That was, that was cool. And a thousands and thousands of books. Yeah, uh, uh, am I the only one who felt really, really sad about the the library burning down? <laughs> no, you're the only one. Akamian felt horrible too. You could tell. He's like, "Are they really going to do this? I mean, I'm going to do it if they're going to do it, but this is madness." He loved books. 
That's the first time I think that he seemed really powerful, like, uh, I don't want to say capable, but he seemed, uh, he seemed like he uh, was powerful in that, during that whole, even though he was taken. It was pretty neat to see him, see that side of uh, Akamian. Yeah, I mean, it was seven, seven to one, including the Grandmaster of the Scarlet Spires. And it talks about, like, sorcery is singing in God's voice, and then the way it described the five mages as, like, performing a concert. I mean, <laughs> they're all just doing, like, different chants, and he's only got his one voice, so they just weathered him down. Yeah, it's true. I didn't realize a, a group of sorcerers is a concert. But yeah, a concert of singing mages <laughs> in God's voice. And yeah. <clears throat> it kind of like revealed <clears throat> how sorcery works in this. It's supposed to be like the voice God used to create the world by like singing it into existence. But since man only knows a fraction, it's like baby talking. So it's like making a mockery of God's voice. So it never like creates, it only destructs. They got no creative magic. Only bad destructive stuff because they can't comprehend the full language or the meaning, I don't think. Hmm. Or who knows, who knows what magic is. That's just what they think it is. It was pretty cool, the the fight scene between the sorcerers. I found myself wondering what was going to happen to Daybreak a lot. Where's his poor donkey going to go? <laughs> He's just sitting outside of the school right now. Maybe Kellis had got him. I don't remember it saying. Yeah, well, I'm not sure why Kellis would need a mule. Well, maybe for survey. He did say he was going to get her one. <laughs> that was the whole plan, just to get the mule. <laughs> it might be a bargaining chip later. If, it, if he can use it for later, he'll get it. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and Esmond is also still there, waiting for a commune. That I, what's the name of the city? Iothea? Iothea? Oh, I forget. Yeah, just in the sticks. Everyone's left her alone and she's just still sitting there. For her. I wonder what's gonna happen. Xenomis yeah. is out looking for her right now. Or looking for a Camion with... I feel like he has some people with him currently. Yeah, the two of his... Uh comrades whose names i absolutely blocked out yeah some secondary characters at the moment <clears throat> i also realize that we're about halfway through the book it's quick it seemed fast yeah it has went pretty quick yeah, well, I'm also um, I'm also sad that we seem to have lost Martimus, the Nansor general, to uh, Callus's little cult. Um, I he just seemed like such a nice, down to earth guy. Not all like all these nobles who always bickering and fighting each other and conspiring. No, he's like, he's like, he says he's like a practical dude who just, he comes, he assesses and then he does and he's done with it. And now he's turning to a, um, blabbering religious fool. So I'm, I'm, I'm sad. And I'm also sad for Confess. Cause yeah. he's, he seemed to be able to, um, negate some of Confess's self I don't know how to describe it 
aggrandizement. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good word. <laughs> yeah, but you can't like if you put yourself in their shoes, it makes sense. They don't. They think Kellis is saying like super badass things, and what it it makes sense to them, kind of. Like Akamian describes, he takes like the geometries, goes further with them, he proves Agensis's logic wrong. He's taking these people to a place they've never been before, and it's like intoxicating to them. If you're there on the ground in a like horrible war where everyone around you is getting hung to trees and like disemboweled. The phantom creatures it says had had it the worst. It didn't sound good for them. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I guess it it just comes as a surprise, and I think maybe we talked about it last week a little bit that uh, Martimus seems like someone who's so like no so no not nonsense and and so loyal to. The, em the Empire into the army that it's just like Kels must be really good to convert someone like him is what I'm trying to say but then Kels knows that he's like walking this fine line because he reiterates it over and over that he, he can't like let them see too fast otherwise it'll be bad for him has to be like a a slow coming around. <laughs> well, I guess I'm just I guess I'm just sad to see Confus losing ground under his feet. You know, it's like everyone hates him. All the great names hate him. Um Martimus, he's lost Martimus. He lost the other general in the in the fight with the Thanieri. You know, I'm concerned. <laughs> Seems like everywhere that the Icarus go, that's what they face. Even like in in their own home, Xerius feels all alone. He hates his what did he call her? Like bitch mother or so, something? Something terrible? Something that would have got soap in my mouth when I was a kid. Yeah, his his relationship with his mother is not something you want to emulate. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What else did you have in your in your notes, Katarina? Um. I, well, there's. There's one part where Cersei, uh, not Cersei, that's someone else, Sir, Sirway, um talks about submission and how um, she's basically found happiness of sorts in completely surrendering to uh, the circumstances. And I guess that's why she allows Callus to to do what whatever he uh whatever he, whatever he wants her to do, including seducing a commian. Um, which just in itself, it's like it's it's pretty horrible. Like just especially when you, when you contrast the way that like the way she thinks of Kellis as like this her god her savior someone who loves her and care, cares for her and then you look at it from an outsider's perspective and you realize he's pimping her around and trading her for favors or for knowledge it's I, it, I don't know, like when you read it, when, when I read it, it doesn't come across as badly, but when I start thinking about it, it makes me so upset the way he treats her more than anyone else. I, mean, I think in real life, the, yeah. that like happens, right? The victim, like when they're in it, they don't like see it clearly. They don't see that they could just get out, so they just stay in a horrible circumstance until someone intervenes somehow. And she's stuck 
in that. She's been stuck in that like her whole life, it seems like, though. Well, ever since she got sold by her dad. Can't she get out there? I mean, was there is there a better, another option for her? I mean, other are the other op options worse than? In her I eyes, mean... he's, he's God, so she's like in the best position in the world. She gets to like play with a god. I mean, it's a good point. I guess her alternative would be going with Nayor, which equally bad. Um, even if his intentions might be pure, it I mean, in, in reality, at least in terms of the consequences, it does, doesn't really matter. Um, so it's just it's just sad to see her at a point where she's given up she's given up any effort to fight her situation and come to a point where she just embraces all the bad that happens to her like she she's she's like she's lost all hope basically is yeah. is is what it is and I guess she finds some peace in it, which may like maybe that's that's a good thing. My my might, might make you feel a little bit a little bit better about her uh, situation, but it's still like it's 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 pretty tough to read. Yeah, I think she's. Uh one of the more sympathetic characters because she is innocent in a way that she doesn't choose. I mean, Espinette, I know she's probably number two on the list, but, you know, she made her choices, but it seems like Survey had no choice. She hasn't had a chance to make a choice. Espinette tried to seduce Kellis at the end of these chapters to get Akamian back. She'll do whatever she has to to get Akamian back at this point. Oh, yeah. Well, that's kind of her, um, that's her, um, weapon, like, or that's what she knows, right? I mean, that's, that's her way of getting what she wants is using, you know, appealing to, to, um, to men that, um, like that. So that, that's, I think she kind of goes back to how she, um, survives. She chooses it, and Sarway does not. Right. Yeah, but not Sarah, really. Sarway probably feels more free, I think, just because of what Kellis has turned her brain into at this point. Thinking all these submissions are a good thing for her, and somehow she's found, like, happiness in it. It's yeah, terrible. I suppose I suppose there is some freedom in in giving up, if you can look at it that way. She's really a, a slave to Kellis, but she doesn't understand that. The way she understands that she was a slave to Nair, Nair treated her more like the slave, for his prize. True, but you know, like maybe the question, like, does it does it matter if she's if she actually feels happy? Does it matter that she's a slave? That's pretty. What depressing. if I, what if I apply that question to the thousands of people that are now listening to Kellis's sermons? Hmm. They're happy, but are, are they now slaves? Kind of. So, um, so Survey, Kellis tells Nair, uh, Nair that that's his baby, but to wonder whether it is or not. I know you can't say it. I, I might guess no, is that we, it is, we, but... We talked about this, and it's definitely not Kellis's, because he never did anything, and he told her that, like, straight to her, but she just like forgot about it she doesn't want to think that yeah i think it's i think it's been established that she was pregnant before uh her and kellis did it the first time 
<laughs> and for some reason, Sarsilus, he hates that. <laughs> the smell of a newborn baby is like the revolting to huh. the skin spies. Before they did it, yeah. It, next time, just send me a list of synonyms I'm allowed to use. No, it's, Cause... it's funny because we, you're we've allowed trying... to use every synonym. Consummated. <laughs> we, uh, was it coupled? Coupling? Uh, what was the other ones? Yeah, we have all, all sorts of interesting ones. We have to add uh, "do it" to the to the list of of uh, yeah. No, it was, it was great. There Look, was a English is a not lot. my first language. <laughs> you, I mean, I think you speak English better than I do, and it's my only language, so you're doing okay. Yeah. Don't make us jealous again. Yeah. Don't but I found a quote from Antilles on the folly of men that says, men are forever pointing. That's why I, I follow the knuckle and not the nail. Oh, that's a cool one. I love that quote. Or it's a quote, right? From yeah. Someone. It's at the beginning of one of the chapters from Antilles. There was like a little poem on love that was pretty cool too. I forgot that said exactly. I don't know where my book is either. Did it finally fall apart? Now I picked it up. Good. It's going <laughs> to live. Um, oh, and the Holy War marches again. They set up a bunch of flotillas, and they are trying to get to Shigeki, is it? I say Shigek, but Shigek. who knows what the pronunciation is. And in doing so, like, they named Nair the war leader or the whatever and they had a banner made after him and that's when he goes through all those weird emotions about feeling proud but hating who's proud of him at the same time and it works they get to the other side without having fought a battle and that's where we end on the doors of the next city to try to siege unless Contis somehow steals it away from them. <laughs> and it sounds like this battle is going to be a lot bigger too. They say all all of the like more famous uh, Sapichas or whatever they call them are there now. So the ones that even an answer know their name. It said that What's his name? Knew them all. Mayor knew them all, but some of the ones that they, I think they said they caught two people and they like interrogated him and the people proved what Mayor said was true, that they didn't have the full army there or even the most powerful of them. Yeah, and even, even Confus agrees with Neor, so it must be true. Yeah, that was a big moment. The dog is right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, so. it's lovely that Confus cares about the army to a point where he's actually willing to agree with a skill Vendi. That's pretty touching, you know? It's, uh, <laughs> you don't get that very often from, from Confus. That's true. He seems to be quite defeated now. He's got sent on the holy war. He's not getting everything they want. They're having to like sneak cities away from the men of the tusk while they march with them. So pretty soon he's going to be like out of reach of Zerius. So it's just going to be Confus's decisions on his own. Once they travel far enough, it's hard to send word back and forth. Like Nathanette won't be able to speak for Sabon either, sooner or later. Hmm. Yeah, the distances are getting longer. 
But yeah, yeah. I guess next week we'll uh, we'll see uh, who's the better general, if uh, Scaris or uh, Nigor. I think uh, part this part ends about a hundred pages from there, right? From where we left off. Part yeah, two? I think so. Should be around four chapters, I think. Let's see. Um, we're on page uh, 294, and the part ends on 390, so 96 pages, 95 pages. That sounds good to me. Cool. <laughs> me as well. Daniel's so. voting, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool, yeah, so we started off saying we did it feel like a lot happened, and here we are an hour and 20 minutes later, you know. I'm sure we missed a couple of things, too. <laughs> I'm Stuck sure. out so briefly and casually mentioned that it's hard to... Capture everything. Oh, they tried to assassinate Kellis and he just like casually stopped it in the middle of a conversation, just continued the conversation. And they just beat the guy to death. <laughs> yeah. Some That's more right. stuff like that I'm sure we missed, but. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Confus almost confesses to Proyas that he's behind the assassination. Yeah, I think that they all but know it. Basically, it was one of Confus's guys. Even Kellis has to know it at this point. Yeah, I think so. It's pretty obvious. If you've been if you've been following the politics, it's pretty obvious. What's going to happen next week, Steve? Any guesses? I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. We got a came in that somewhere. I don't think we'll see a came in and Kellis together for a while. I'll say that. Maybe Could came in and have wrote all these passages already? Oh. I, th I think he survives... Um, well, I think he survives this trilogy, I'm guessing. But I don't think he'll be with Kellis for a while. I think he'll, or Esmanet, either. They were having too much fun. It can't happen. That's... <laughs> the fun meter was, you know, going too far over. That's can't have that so that's so, true we'll see yes we will I'm trying to judge it their facial expressions and but it's hard you guys are pretty good about <laughs> so much happens that my facial expressions just betray can't betray any one thing yeah yeah well, cool. Well, so we'll finish off part two uh, next week. So, awesome. Uh, Katarina, do you want to tell us where to get in touch with you if someone wants to reach out and talk about books? Um, sure. Uh, the easiest way to find me is on the page chewing forum. And I'm also on Instagram at The Errant. Uh, you can follow me there or chat with me there. Um, be happy to, to hear from you. Nice. And Daniel, random person on the internet that doesn't want to be found, where can people find you? Just think if you really need to say anything to me, and you probably don't. So. But if you do, you can just comment in on the YouTube video when it comes up. Nice. Cool. Well, everybody, thanks for listening, and we'll uh, see everyone next week. Until then, have a good one. Bye. Bye.